Uh, welcome everybody. I'm Thomas Morgan. Uh, friends call me Timo. Uh, I want to send a big shout out to John Sanchez and climatesprints.com. Uh, Air miners, John, this is like an awesome format. We've, I feel like we've accomplished a lot. If you haven't checked it out, go to climatesprints.com and, and, and take a look. Uh, big thanks to everyone who answered all the questions, emails, did meetings, et cetera. Uh, we have a super amazing team. I'm super proud of, of what we've produced. And I could not have done it without uh, everyone who contributed and whatnot. So now, without uh, further ado, welcome to Digestible Climate Finance. No notice I said air quotes on digestible because it's a nod to uh, what lies ahead. If we can just pause for a second and ask ourselves, you'll see why in a minute, but is my investment strategy healthy? Or ask yourself, is my climate project nutritious? So just, just keep that in mind and you'll, you'll, you'll note the digestible in the title as we go along. Sprint team came together for 21 days to answer one main question. We're all volunteers, we're unfunded. <laughs> all the work is open source. We're just contributing it to the greater climate community. Uh, so super excited to do that. We didn't know each other at the start, but the desire uh, is to find an answer to this one question. That question in climate sprint parlance what is, is a problem pack. And that problem pack is how can we best value long-term co-benefits and ecosystem services when mobilizing climate finance? So that's what we're focused on today. Excellent. So just wanting to introduce the team, when you do a project like this, like Thomas said, and by the way, I'm Natalie Braxton, you're going to hear a variety of voices today. And once again, I'm grateful for this climate sprint being put together. But one of the things I'm even more grateful for are the diversity of people involved in this. And when you have massive problems like this, it's hard to just go to a recruiter and have people you know, just show up. It takes a multi-dynamic, multidisciplinary team. So you're going to be hearing voices from Neil, Tommy, Shannon, Cassandra. Of course, you just heard Thomas and I'm Natalie, and I'm going to turn it over because this is the heart of how these problems get to their solutions. And without all the people that you see on the slides, um, we wouldn't be able to do this. They put their hearts, their souls, their intellect, and their brains into this whole endeavor. And it really truly has been an honor. And I'm excited to see what everyone does going forward and together potentially. Thank you. All right, so this question, how can we best value long-term co-benefits and ecosystem services when mobilizing climate finance? It's timely. Um, this is the UN Climate Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. It's also imperative because as reported on the August 28th Bloomberg Green article, Funds holding $10 trillion are told their ecosystem services goals fall short. Investment funds aren't currently on the same page as the science. So in this article, the former executive secretary of the UNFC on climate change, Christina Figueres, said, sovereign wealth funds concern with climate change has so far focused overwhelmingly on managing climate risk and taking advantage of the opportunities resulting from the low carbon transition. But given the gravity of the climate crisis, this is no longer sufficient. So there's a lot of money going to climate projects, but it's not making a meaningful impact. As this team reviewed the existing body of work in this sphere, we came to the realization that the problem may not lie in evaluation, but in the communication of value to stakeholders, namely investors and project developers. We determined that there are a significant number of frameworks for valuing benefits across environmental, societal, economic, and financial sectors, each of them with different methods and metrics, but there's no standard of communicating this complex research to stakeholders. This leaves stakeholders with wide gaps of crucial decision-making information. This breakdown of communication between those doing complex research and those deciding where to invest climate capital leaves investors vulnerable to risky choices and missed opportunities, it leaves project developers unaware of the total impact they may have, and it leaves potentially invaluable projects underfunded and undervalued. This disconnect, these opportunity gaps between stakeholder knowledge and existing data, between carbon-focused and non-carbon-focused stakeholder values, and between current financing and the funding opportunities that exist, is where we identified the seed for our solution. We want to build something that helps to bridge these gaps. So... To confirm our assessment, we, we went to work. We basically did our homework. 
We talked with 11 global investors from individuals to seed funds, to venture capital, to institutional grade investors. The fund size are in range from with a little of $400,000 fund to 200 million to $2 billion fund size. Across those different spectrum, spectrums, they were making individual investments as small as 25,000 and up to $100 million per investment. We also talked to 15 project developers, whether they be carbon forest projects, regenerative agriculture, biochar, blue carbon, and as well as other projects such as sustainability apps, fintech startups, film, even a filmmaker, climate and sustainability consultants, and even a blockchain network protocol. And we talked to some city and federal officials. What we mainly asked them is, where is the friction or the bottlenecks to getting deals done? And what keeps you up at night about this? As Cassie indicated, the answers ranged across the board, but all related to some sort of gap, whether it be a quality gap, an expertise gap, data, knowledge, funding, deal size, as well as a matchmaking gap. Many indicated that they either were overloaded with too much general information, broad, or were concerned about the time and money involved with verifications and outside experts, very specific, detailed, deep information. Several investors mentioned the life cycle assessment or an LCA, which is common in the environmental world. One saw the need for a simplified LCA as a forcing function to get people or startups that they invest in or climate projects to consider all the impacts associated with their projects. And they told a great story by that, which after, if you wanna ask me, make, make sure I'll, I'll tell you that one. One of the biggest takeaways that they reinforce is that they are doing this to make money. Impact is super important, but making a financial return is required and they have to be able to report that to investors. So what we found, um, the focus right now in the climate finance world is on carbon and rightly so. But by focusing solely on carbon, we become blind to the many other environmental, social, economic, and financial benefits that these carbon and climate projects can provide. By focusing solely on carbon, these other co-benefits are relegated to externalities, not measured, not considered, not valued. So we wanted to change that. Uh, we reviewed a bunch of different methodologies, 43 diff uh, different methodologies. Um, and we really wanted to rebrand co-benefits to core benefits. Um, in this way, we, we get to approach holistic environmental value as a complex network of core benefits rather than one valued benefit, carbon, and a smattering of co-benefits. This enables us to unlock more value and consider a benefits and impact on a level playing field to better assess the combined total impact to address these global goals. But as you can see, systemic value is complex, real complex. Uh, what you're seeing here is just a small sample size of the different metrics and the different things that we want to consider um, when actually trying to assess total environmental uh, value. So the big challenge that we, that we face during the sprint is how do we take this complexity and make it uh, approachable? We need a cohesive picture so that we can have like a landscape level uh, for comparison against similar and, and dissimilar uh, projects um, that are being considered in the climate finance realm. And so to that, we, we, we turn to scorecards. Uh, scorecards have um, ha had a really good history of translating systemic complexity into something digestible and usable. And more, more and more now, scorecards are being integrated into de decision-making so that it doesn't need to be um, an excess of uh, time, money, and expertise at every single level. They can just be used as a decision-making tool to guide better investments and, and guide better projects for the future. With all that complexity, we had to somehow distill it down and figure out where, where do we focus or, or how maybe should people focus. And so we looked at measurability and we asked the question, how do project developers and investors start to simplify but do so in an effective way? And we asked, what can they measure and what is most important of those measurements? The answer, based on the stakeholder interviews, depends on the wins that someone, a, a company, a fund, a project developer, whoever is looking through. But the investor thesis and the scientific reports revealed three main areas that kept coming up time and time again. Those three main areas are carbon, nature, and people. And this aligns with what the IPCC and the IPBES call the climate, biodiversity, 
social system nexus. Long word, we're gonna shorten that down to carbon nature people. So we asked, how can we quantify the core benefits in these areas to measure against the global goals or the SDGs? And this is what we came up with. Introducing core benefits facts. So we've made that switch from co to core. We've named it core benefits. Uh, we've given everything uh, equal footing on the label itself. And if this format looks familiar to you, it's because we were inspired by the humble nutrition facts label that we're all used to seeing on packaged foods. Uh, imagine being able to turn over the cracker box on your climate investment and quickly get important information that helps you make a holistic decision about how to invest. While a nutrition label contains a lot of information about very complex subject, which is nutrition and your health, it's intuitive, it's information dense, and it's approachable for a wide variety of people. Uh, like Timo said, we interviewed everyone from people looking to invest $25,000 to very large institutional investors who are looking to do many, many millions. Note that just like the nutrition label, the summary information on it is all backed by deeper, uh, more debated, refined measurement models. And um, if you've been around nutrition labels long enough, you know that they've changed over time. So the most recent update was in 2016. We started getting information about added sugars. Um, we anticipate that any kind of label that accompanies these investments would have a similar type of evolution over time. Um, we have collected list of various ecosystem and holistic system benefit models, which all have methodologies around how to measure what you see on the label. So this would be backed in data and it would be backed in known methodologies. So let's see what that might look like when you take our little nutrition label and you apply it to an actual project. So here's an example of a forestry project. Uh, this project could be considered a carbon project, depending on which investor you're talking to. But the core benefits label gives equal footing to all the benefits associated with the project itself. So uh, as an example, this is a project um, that is uh, to reforest community owned lands in the Himalayas to do so in a way that integrates agricultural land um, and uh, benefits for the local community, both economically and in terms of culture. It gives them a sense of ownership. It's also planting trees, so it is carbon negative. And you can see that we use a vector-based visual uh, approach to the nutrition label. So whereas you might be used to seeing something like how many milligrams or how much percent of my recommended daily value, in this version, we simply said, is it considered a, a high positive, a mid positive, a low positive? And we simply use these vector arrows to quickly kind of in, in, in an information dense way, uh, communicate the benefits that, um, that exist for the project. Um, this is a great look at one project, but the real power of the label comes when you go to compare one project to another. Projects such as a traditional carbon uh, commodity project. Um, project that we're considering here uh, essentially is digging up uh, savanna or grasslands and planting very, very fast growing, very, very carbon dense trees that may or may not be native to, to, to the area. Traditionally, if only comparing one to one only on carbon, this project will look very, very good because it is uh, optimizing and maximizing that metric. However, taking a more holistic, holistic view, you may see that, that uh, maximizing and optimizing only for, for carbon sequestration has some pretty significant trade-offs. Now, the goal here is not to say that one project is better than the other. It's simply to demonstrate and have a tool to show that th those trade-offs for decision makers so that they can make better decisions uh, based on their priorities, their goals, and wh where their market needs are right now. Um, and with that, I hand it off to Shannon of Diverse Climate Impact. So here we have, um, I'm looking at uh, comparing these two projects and for my investment portfolio, which has a goal of say two um, gigatons of carbon uh, dioxide per year by uh, 2017, or I'm sorry, 2027, uh, and also a temperature target of lowering uh, the glo Earth's global temperature by uh, a, a fraction of a degree. Um, so what I'd like to do is, so Neil and Tommy, if you could both speak to your projects. Um, Neil, could you first tell me a little bit about why the land uh, use and uh, conservation is so high? Um, and then, well, Tommy, 
um, sure. your project? So because this project was undertaken with an eye towards local control and making sure that there is an actual return to the local community, and it's a restoration project, it's taking a formerly degraded piece of land and improving it, um, the land use change is really positive here. Not only do we get a uh, forest where we used to have it in a restored landscape, but also there's benefit for the local community in the form of healthier and more sustainable agricultural lands, which they can then use as an economic base and to improve their own local environment. So for, for, for the Savannah project, what we're doing is we're actually converting native grassland into something that is not at all native to, to that area. We're planting the equivalent of eucalyptus trees in an area that eucalyptus never, ever evolved. We're also do, doing this plantation monoculture style to really maximize the carbon. So again, this project is only focused on carbon. And as a result, the land use change is going to have a negative impact um, on the surrounding savanna habitat. And obviously, this is um, almost the opposite of, of conservation because we're introducing something that has never really existed in, in this ecosystem before. Got it. And, and then I see carbon um, is both high for both projects. Um, so can, can you tell me a little bit about why carbon appears under the air quality? Sure. Um, well, because CO2 has obviously been taken um, from the air and a lot of the techniques that we're using also tend to improve local air quality by adding more trees to the environment, we decided to classify carbon under, the, under that category. Um, also, it gives an equal footing to, uh, to the, other, um, the other elements in the project, um, including the economic, societal, and financial benefits beyond merely just the environmental. And as you can see from, from the, uh, the plantation pr project, carbon is actually better if you're, if you're considering that metric. However, um, it is going to have lower impact on the, um, the other indicators of, of air quality in the area and going to have a negative impact on um, the, the water usage, the water requirements for this forest, and the, the water quality runoff that comes from, uh, from, from the needs of watering and keeping this forest watered. Excellent. Well, thank you. As Tommy and Neil and Shannon just pointed out, one of the, the main features of the core benefits label is a side-by-side -side comparison. You can quickly compare projects side by side. But a, a second use is actually how to make a project more valuable, more useful, higher return, higher impact. And so we're gonna use a little example here on kind of a, a project that I'm working on, a personal project that takes into account all these different societal problems. But one of the main goals of the sprint was that the sprint, that whatever the solution was, that it be easily repeatable, rapidly deployable, and exponentially scalable. And the core benefits label to me is these things. And this is where the core benefits label excels. And to show how extensible it is, this urban resiliency project, we're just gonna use this as a sample. We're gonna start with a blank label and we're gonna show, we're just gonna take a look at it. So I'm gonna give you a few breakdowns of the, the project but it tackles multiple large societal in, impacts or problems in cities across the US. This is Dayton, Ohio, but this could easily be applied to New Orleans, Philly, or many, many other cities across the US. In Dayton, for example, there's 11,000 properties threatened by flood events. Dayton is number 10 in the US where temperatures exceed 90 degrees by the number of days in the year. And a third problem is there's another 11,000 properties in the city were, that are vacant or considered blight, technically abandoned. Flint, Detroit, Philly, it, it's hard to believe, but there's hundreds of thousands of vacant properties across the US that are just sitting there vacant, causing community problems. We're gonna look at it through two different lenses. The, the first one, going back to the nutrition label is like a nutrition plan. So this is like a bespoke investment creation where custom, we're actually creating a project from, from scratch. And this is actually how I created this Dayton Urban Resilience Project. I said, okay, how many problems can we tackle in one project? So we use a blank label and define what's important to you. And it really depends on your wins. And let's just say you're focused for this example on climate justice and carbon removal. So this is where we create the nutrition plan. Make your own project. And so this project, for example, that we're creating has the two main things. We, we figured out climate justice, we figured out carbon removal, but the label helps you 
create this bespoke project by helping you look at other things and to make the project or the investment healthier. And in this case, we can add biodiversity and green infrastructure to our, our wine items. And we could take it further, but this is just an example for a use case. The second way to use the Wavel to make a project better is what I call, or we, we call the meal plan. Basically taking blind spots in the project and turning those into opportunity. And this goes back to what Cassie talked about, the opportunity gap. So if we were to start with a blank label, we know what the project is, we assess the project, fill out the label, we know what it does well in. And just you know, without going into deep analysis, top level, we know it does well in carbon, air quality improvement, water quality improvement, land use, conservation, restoration, biodiversity, health and safety, and financial return. And then we can look at, okay, how do we take it further? So how do we make the project more nutritious? Where are the blind spots? In this example, did we think about water supply, solid waste, energy, potential market size, or consider economic mobility? For me, you know, assessing this project or doing the project, I looked at market size. So that was already, it wasn't a blind spot for me. But I, in, in all reality, I didn't consider water supply or solid waste or how the project could actually affect energy. So now I have my, my gears turning and saying, okay, how can I make this project more investable? To me, this is where the opportunity is, as we showed in the opportunity gap. The deal as is or as planned and what the value could be added or created. And that's what we're looking at. You know, we didn't really go into it on this project, for example, because this is just a sample project. But one of the best parts of the core benefits label is it does look at financial metrics. We can't do any of this work without being financially successful. And as the saying goes in my business, in the real estate business, you're only as good as your last deal. The core benefits label fully considers financial metrics such as equity, profit, market size, and adaptive capacity or, or risk, basically. And so as my friends at Impact Alpha say, come for the returns, but stay for the impact. When we are looking at how to assess this, the big question that may be on your mind is how do we do this? What we've just seen is the front face of what would be a very three-dimensional, dynamic, robust back system that aggregates data. We are in a time where not only do we need a diversity, uh, an eclectic, amazing, dynamic team, we need dynamic tools to match with those teams. And so we look at a holistic way and the next iteration of AI, artificial intelligence, and possibly as this iterates, quantum computing. And to bring all this data together so that we can get not only data that's already existing, but aggregate real-time data to create even more access to accurate data. So this opportunity gap can really fill in and we can really see where we can make a difference and where opportunities lie. And with that, I'll pass that to you, Neil, to get into a little bit more detail. Sure. As someone who's designed analytic systems before in my career, that's, that's where I came from and that's how I came to climb it. Um, I am a fully aware of the complexity associated with a multi-source system like this that requires mastering of data on a massive scale. Uh, as Natalie mentioned, there are innovations in machine learning and AI which can make this go faster. Um, but um, as any good designer of an analytic system will tell you, uh, defining the use case and the user goals in the first place is the most important part of the system design. So by making the front end first and by telling everyone where we're headed, we know what we need to do on the back end in terms of getting all the ETL and data sources correct and get every, everything onboarded. And we can have a good estimate of the amount of uh, engineering that would be necessary in order to make this possible. I would also point out <clears throat> that the data, while very robust and multidisciplinary, did take the form in version one of vector information. Uh, this gives us a limited space <clears throat> of goal data from which our source data need to feed. So do we need to be precise down to the milligram of sodium like you would on a nutrition label or the one to 2% of iron that's supposed to be in your diet? Not in the first case. And <clears throat> it will be some time before the data and the measurement of all those things on the complexity slide that Tommy showed you will be at a maturity level where we would even be able to consider that. The nice thing about the vector approach 
is one that is digestible and approachable and information dense, but also it solves some of the problems we might have on the back end with the data, getting down to specific numbers and instead allows us to identify ranges that we can pull that data into and still provide value to the people who are using the label. And maybe we'll do another climate sprint for that <laughs> with a lot more data engineering. So Neil gets to have more fun. That is always important. Um, so to sum up, uh, the core benefits label takes data and information from the whole ecosystem and synthesizes it into a means that is accessible and usable for a wide variety of stakeholders. Um, what we discussed in this presentation, what we've considered over the short time frame, three weeks that, that we had, we believe only scratches the surface of what is possible with this tool. Um, as Neil and Natalie just, uh, just alluded to, we designed this tool to be adaptable to the needs and priorities of a wide variety of different organizations and stakeholders. Uh, so what we would love from you our, our wonderful audiences, we want to work with you. We, we want you to send us your projects. We want to apply the, this tool and this framework to as many different projects as possible, nonprofits, corporate sustainability projects, um, and beyond. We believe that working together, we can elevate and value the full benefits of climate project using the core benefits label as a decision-making tool. On a personal note, this has been a very passionate undertaking by a group of really awesome people. And I think we are very excited about the potential and would love to hear your thoughts and questions about the climate sprint. So thank you so much.